Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad you could make it to the Brown Bag Lecture. Uh, my name is Chandra, and I work at the Penticton Museum. And the museum is happy to be able to bring these lectures to you on a weekly basis every Tuesday from noon to one, which is why you showed up now. Yeah. And the, today, I'm happy to introduce uh, Merle Kindred. And she is, um, let me talk to, sorry, I feel like I'm just gonna shift over a little bit. She's in, uh, she was in social development, in international development, and uh, she's gonna speak about one of her last postings, which was in Guyana, which is why I'm sure a lot of you are here. So I'm, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, one, if you don't mind, just checking out your cell phones and switching them to a, a way where they won't interrupt our lovely speaker. All right, um, I'm ready to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you. Hello, I'm glad to see all of you here today. And I'm also glad to be here as a guest on the land of the Silic people of the Okanagan Nation. And I bear responsibility for being part of settler stock in Saskatchewan, who a century and a quarter ago believed that there was something called free land in a place called Canada. And so they came. And there's absolutely nothing in my century's worth of family history that ever refers to the indigenous peoples of this land, the First Nations. So I wish to make a special acknowledgement and thanks to the Silix people of the Okanagan. Well, here we are. I've been doing international development projects for all my adult life, and this is, as Chandra said, my most recent posting. This is my favorite picture from the whole collection. This young gal is in the wetlands of the uh, Akawini territory, and she is poling not only one dugout canoe, but two canoes. My hero. <laughs> I was in Guyana focusing on gender equality and social inclusion, and this certainly deals with uh, powerful women in the making. Guyana, spelled with an I, in, Ar in the Arawak language, means land of many waters. And that certainly is true for Guyana. Now, I hear when I was preparing for this posting in early 2017. Oh, you're off to Africa. Uh, no, not Ghana or Gambia or Gabon. I reply, actually, I'm heading for South America. And here we are. Venezuela is to the west. Of, of Guyana. Georgetown is the capital. It's on the northeast coast of the country. Suriname, which used to be Dutch Guyana, spelled with an I, is to, its, uh, is to the east. And farther on is French Guiana. There were originally three Guianas. Now, and there's still three, but they're named differently. <clears throat> The, and you can see where the Amazon River starts, high in the Andes Mountains, in the southern part of Peru, and then heading up through the mountains, across Brazil, and then there are tributaries that go all the way to the coast of South America. <clears throat> now, Guyana is more readily recognized as British Guiana, but that all ended in 1966. <clears throat> it's um, before, in, that was its name before. In I think that the country is shaped somewhat like a, a torso. Here are the broad shoulders. There's Georgetown up there. Here's the narrow waist, the wasp waist. And here's the wide hips. 
Now the areas that I was most familiar with were the coastal floodplains up here, where all of these rivers, large and small, ended up in the Atlantic. So this would have been region four, the center of the city, of the country. This is the mighty Essequibo River that snakes all the way through other parts of South America. And this is region two up here, an area that's fairly remote and which you're going to hear about quite a bit later in the presentation. And that would be region two. This, the Rupununi area is region nine. And you'll also be hearing about this area, which I could only get to by plane. There are no roads of any, of any uh, sort going through the rainforests. All right, the Spanish, the Spanish and the Portuguese were the original explorers in what was called the New World. They were sort of the proto-colonialists. Uh, in the 1500s. They were extracting resources, gold and silver, and they were using indigenous slave labor, working them to death, if necessary. <clears throat> then came the Dutch and the French. The English explored the coast uh, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, and she sent her man, Sir Walter Raleigh, to see what the uh, potential was for doing uh, trade in this area. But they didn't settle and colonize immediately. <clears throat> Eventually, the English and the Dutch battled it out for control of what is now known as Guyana uh, in the early 1800s. And the three Guianas were created. Now, from the 1600s to the 1830s, Africans were enslaved uh, for sugar plantation work throughout the Caribbean, including Guyana. Now, when slavery was abolished, um, indentured laborers from India were lured in for years of field work on the sugarcane plantations in exchange for their passage fare. Now, Guyana is roughly the size of England, Scotland, and Wales. Uh, they have a combined, now those three areas of the world have a combined population of 64 plus million. Guyana has a population of three quarters of a million. Mm -hmm. And 90% of the population is up here on the northeast coast of the country. This land of many waters has a sea wall started by the Dutch and extended by the British 280 miles long. And it's been there since the mid 19th century with repairs and extensions. As you can see, it's about the height of a person, probably about five feet, sometimes five and a half feet. I'm, I'm about five and a half feet tall, so it's about, about my height. And I would routinely see, um, at high tide, see seawater flowing over the top of the um, seawall. And of course, with climate change, that's an increasing phenomenon. To the right is what's called a coker. That would be a, a Dutch design, or it's a sluice gate. Because what happened as Guyana was being colonized is there were canals put in to drain the sugarcane plantations. There were also canals and ditches run through all the settled areas on the coast so that when they had their two major rainfalls um, each season, the water could drain out. It would drain out automatically at low tide through the sluice gates. And this was a way to keep both the plantation fields and the settlements from flooding. Here I am in the high country of the North Rupununi, down there at the um, mid part of Guyana. <clears throat> and I'm overlooking the uh, mighty Essequibo River, along with my guide, Marcy, who's of the Makushi 
tribe in Guyana, and were birding. I'd arrived a month before Easter in 2017, and I had a long weekend, so I decided I would fly into indigenous territory in the interior and do some birding. Now, Guyana is one of about three dozen uh, of the most biodiverse areas on the planet. It has gold, diamonds, bauxite for making aluminum, tropical rainforests filled with valuable hardwood. It also abounds in uh, thousands of plants, animals, invertebrates, and has more than 900 species of birds. Half, the, uh, half of them are endemic, which means they're native to the region and are there all the time. A quarter migrate to the Arctic, the very tip of North America, to breed and feed, and then they come back down during the northern winter months back to South America. And another quarter of the species head down to South America, again seasonally, for breeding and feeding to the very tip of the uh, continent and then fly back. <clears throat> the Rupununi has, um, let's see, ah, there are also large creatures, jaguars, giant uh, river otters, caimans, which are a kind of alligator, ocelots, which are smaller than jaguars and have a different patterning, and giant ant eaters. And Guyana is considered a Caribbean culture, even though it's on the continent, and it's the only English-speaking country uh, in South America. Now, the Rupununi has three distinct eco-regions. There is the savanna, which this is in the dry season, uh, it also has rainforests, which uh, are about 80% of the country at this point in time, and those are in the background. And also in the far distance, you can see the mountains to the west. This is the Pacaraima range, which uh, separates Guyana from Venezuela. And the fourth ecoregion is the coastal floodplains, which you'll be seeing more of as the pre presentation continues. But how did I come to be in Guyana? I was with Canada's CUSO International, established in 1961, the same year as the US Peace Corps. I came of age in the 1960s and had a year of international development work uh, experience in education and public health in the US Virgin Islands. In the late 1970s, I spent two years with CUSO doing teacher education in Jamaica. They asked if I mind going to Montego Bay. I said, well, okay. <laughs> now I was posted for six months to, with CUSO to help create a strategic plan for this organization, a Guyanese NGO. The organization had four programs three for at-risk students. There were after-school programs, there were programs for training about possible careers in the country, and those would be conducted in the high school. There was a Big Brothers, Big Sisters program. And they also had a fourth program where they were helping other NGOs with organizational matters. Now I spent much of my time talking and listening to staff and meeting to discuss concepts such as SWAT, good old SWAT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats to the organization. And then we cooked up something called GOSAR. We looked at our vision and our mission statements and our programs and we decided we needed a cycle to work. We'd have to have a goal for the program's mission statement, objectives, how are we going to get to that goal, what sort of strategies uh, would we structure to meet those objectives, what kind of activities could we do to support the strategies, 
And then how are we going to measure results? Um, measuring and evaluation and uh, evaluating outcomes and impacts. Were we meeting uh, the goals? Were we fulfilling the mission and uh, the vision of VYC? And as you can see, we're doing this low tech. This is good old newsprint on uh, flip charts. Mm -hmm. Exxon Mobil had just discovered a huge offshore oil deposit. I'd been there about two months when they said, it's the biggest find of petroleum that we've discovered in the last 10 years. I had to be careful about uh, help with ExxonMobil's plans for a robotics lab as a sort of goodwill gesture to the community and have it based at VYC. I couldn't be seen or heard uh, connecting with a giant, with an oil giant, as it might have upset CUSO donors in Canada. I learned through the soles of my sandals. So I continued the bird watching that I'd started in the latter, <clears throat> in the latter years. <clears throat> Let me try the potato myself. I'd started birding in the uh, last few years of my work in and out of India and uh, with an NGO there. This is an orange-winged uh, Amazon. It's a parrot. And it was both an urban and a hinterland bird. Now, hinterland was used with no negative connotations in Guyana. This bird liked to congregate. In the evenings, a flock would return to the coconut tree just outside my bedroom window in Georgetown and chatter over the day's events. Then there would be an avian alarm clock every morning. I also enjoyed studying the architecture of over two centuries of British colonial life as I tromped through Georgetown. My late husband was an award-winning architect and both of us were interested in promoting energy efficient design for lower income people. I continue to be fascinated by traditional designs, materials, and construction strategies uh, when they were combined with appropriate modern technology for sustainable building practices. I called this the pant legs up design. It was suitable for coastal floodplains of Georgetown and the East Coast, where there was quite often serious flooding. These are the Demerara louvers. The Demerara River was the west, western boundary of Georgetown. The louvers are painted tan here, and they were named for the nearby river, Demerara. Before air conditioning, blocks of ice were placed on the lower edges, and the north-south planning of many of the city streets meant that the sea breezes regularly blew through the city and cooled buildings. Note the rolls of razor wire over the gate. Cuso designated Guyana as a potentially dangerous posting with drug trafficking from Colombia arms shipments, smuggling of gold and other resources, even tropical birds and animals. Independence shattered the country in 1966, as, the, as in many other British colonies when the Commonwealth of Nations was established and they were suddenly untethered from the rule of empire. Many disgruntled Guyanese left, and the impact on communities was shown graphically in their buildings. When I left the country five years ago, it was considered a no-growth population, with those exiting matching the number of those being born. I like images of the old and the new, 
and they were ever present. The long, narrow cart on the right was from the old plantation days to haul cut sugar cane from the fields. Ah, the Caribbean market, with an abundance of fruits and vegetables, spices and eggs, fish and meat. In the U.S. Virgin Islands, in the Bahamas where I'd worked, it was plain old supermarkets because of dependence on nearby US, the nearby uh, U.S. suppliers. In Jamaica, I'd happily haggle with Higglers, saying that I was trying to keep every penny, and Higglers chuckling and saying, and me trying to get every penny. <laughs> Canals and ditches threaded through the city for drainage during the rainy seasons. This striated heron with its neck tucked in is waiting for the next meal to swim by, and then it'll extend itself and grab a tasty morsel. With Guyana's rating as dangerous by international standards and Cuso's cautions, I occupied myself in the evenings with reading and my tropical handcraft of choice, embroidery. I cut the panel out of linen cloth from Fabricland before I left for Guyana, brought just the panel with me, and I embroidered this pair of uh, blue and yellow macaws, a kind of parrot, from a photograph I'd taken in Georgetown. So this is now my, whenever I present, I wear this vest. Mm -hmm. Ta-da! <laughs> and there's further samples of both indigenous Guyanese embroidery and also the, um, the birding vest that I used um, out in the field. What's left of it is there with the embroidered back panel. You can check that later. The population of Guyana is a kaleidoscopic array of ethnicities and mixed heritages. Here's my Indo-Guyanese birding guide, Andy, and favorite Afro-Guyanese taxi driver, Linton. Each fellow represented about a quarter of the population. The nine tribes of the indigenous peoples are about 10% of the total population. The balance of the country's population is made up of mixed race citizens, people from Brazil, Venezuela, a variety of European countries, Canada, Saga, Russia, and now the U.S. with ExxonMobil inserting itself into the country. China has a huge unnamed embassy with the architecture obviously divine, defining its identity. The um, international representations are all about the immense natural resources of this wee country. Here's the Hoaxin that Andy and Linton and I spotted on the East Coast. It's the national bird, also called the kanji pheasant, with a pouch in its throat that ferments its food, which gives off a foul odor, earning the species another local name, stinky pheasant. Marketing remained a joy. Guyanese cook-up was uh, the customary uh, Caribbean peas and rice, or rice and peas dish, depending on which island country one was in, with peas really being the uh, favorite beans of the region. However, Guyana, a Guyanese cook-up had Indian spicing, which made it distinctive and delicious. One market day, I was having a calabash bowl filled with cook-up from my favorite Rastafarian restaurant. A tall young woman ordered the same cook-up. I said, excuse me, I can't place your accent. She replied, 
I'm from Vancouver in Canada. <laughs> and I'm from Penticton. Lydia was of Guyanese heritage with family who were part of the diaspora, who had exited Guyana decades earlier. She was an urban farmer with experience in tropical food and soil restoration. I explained my presence uh, with CUSO, found her intrigued, and arranged for her to meet my program manager the next day. Lydia became a CUSO volunteer in indigenous territory the next year. Sometimes bridging of knowledge and needs comes from knowing what one doesn't know and seeking help elsewhere. I traveled into the rainforests for bird watching with indigenous guides whenever possible. Rewa was a remote eco lodge with travel that included flying, dusty dirt roads, and river travel in a small boat. Here's a house in the village of Rewa. They're boiling poisonous cassava juice long enough to make it the base for pepper pot soup. And then they'll be grating of the cassava, a root plant, to make cassava bread, which is a staple of Guyanese diet. This is Parika, heading up the west coast. Near the end of my six-month appointment, uh, or assignment, a Peace Corps volunteer I'd met gath at a gathering of expats in Georgetown suggested that I travel up the northwest coast to Region 2. It would be four and a half hours of road and river travel, including one of these closed speedboats in the Essequibo estuary on the coast of the Atlantic. So I made the trip. At Supanam, a Dutch name from Guyana's uh, pre-British history, I took another land taxi to Charity, south of the coast here, uh, and then traveled south from the coast and landed here on the shores of the Pomeroon River, yet another Dutch name. Then another ri river taxi to Adele's Rainforest Resort. A Guyanese descendant of an escapee from the French Revolution two and a half centuries prior had turned farm buildings into a rustic resort. This whole long journey was a great introduction to the settlements and rice plantations of the coastal floodplains here in the Northwest. Adele's interior had the comfort of an old slipper. There was a shade house for growing produce. Abundant tropical fruit came from trees and plants in the, this centuries old agricultural site and provided food for the resort and for sale to the community. In the nearby indigenous village of Wakapo, we saw a homemade coconut and cassava grinding machine that a family used to produce food for home and sale to the community. Here's the beauty of the wetlands with the inhabited uh, and planted high ground in the distance. Wakapo was primarily Arawak, with several highland settlements and a population of about 3,000. It was heartening to see renewable energy in the territories. Adels had wind and solar power. The federal government had supplied solar pan panels for the villagers. The wetlands had rivers for transportation, no roads.
On my final morning at Adele's doing some birding on Aquini Creek, our boat driver suddenly slowed his speed, reversed the engine, and backed into a narrow channel off the creek. There was a pair of red and black birds with white markings. I snapped a quick picture of one as the other flew. I later learned that I provided the first ever photograph in the wild of this reclusive bird, the crimson hooded mannequin. The photo went uh, viral online with 500 hits the first day. This is a harpy eagle. I, this is not my photograph. It comes from an online source. It's the second largest eagle in the world. It stands nearly a meter tall, which would be half my height, with a wingspan of over six feet. It's named for the fierce creatures of Greek and Roman myth with female heads and bodies of a bird. They personified storm winds. People in Region 2 settlements knew of harpy eagle nests and were longing to develop ecotourism facilities that I'd experienced earlier in the year in the North Rupununi at the center of the country. Suddenly, I was inspired to write a placement description for an ecological and economic development advisor and see if PUSO would support such a posting in Indigenous territories. Now, I do have reservations about tourism, the number one business in the world, especially with its transportation demands. <clears throat> However, I also know that tourism is sometimes the only source of income for third world countries now called the Global South. The carbon impact of any kind of tourism is significant. However, we need reminders of the majesty and critical importance of biodiverse regions, such as Guyana. My program manager was delighted with the idea, and together we sent a proposal up the chain of command to CUSO headquarters in Ottawa. The result? Three months later, I was sent back for another half year posting. Here's our departure from Adele's on a Harpy Eagle nest quest. There's Jessica, a refugee from the stressful UK marketing career, who'd been in Guyana 10 years prior and was volunteering to manage Adele's. Her partner, Ian, was born in Guyana, but part of the diaspora since age 10. He'd circled back to his taproot country for permanent residency and had skills in mechanical engineering, musical performance and composition, and he was a master chef. Jessica got to him first. I was a conduit for bridging connections to, to CUSO contacts and funding and ability to travel back and forth between Georgetown and Region 2 as needed. We would be exploring upriver in the neighboring settlement of Akawini with a population of around 800, again scattered on high country in the wetlands. The Tusha, or chief's eldest sons, Elijah and Jacob, were loggers and knew of an eagle's nest in the forest area above their settlement of Waikanipa. They would serve as guides, spotters, porters, boat handlers, and camp builders. Here is the first night's camp, with the lads setting the poles and hanging the hammocks and tarps. As Jessica prepared a basic camp dinner near dusk, I was sent out to find a spot to view a huge nest uh, spotted when timbering. 
I stumbled through tangled underbrush watching for snakes and sat on a fallen log aiming my camera at a large nest while scratching sand flies. Suddenly, a big white bird, slightly tinted by the colors of sunset, landed. But what? It didn't look like the harpy eagle, male or female, in my birding book. It took two months to identify this bird. The creek grew shallower over the next two days, but we kept pulling and pulling with more obstacles. I judged that exhaustion was setting, uh, setting in, making us prone to accidents. Jessica had seen a harpy eagle on a three-day trip in pouring rain she'd taken with local guides during the time I was back in Canada. She said it flew directly overhead between two trees with that six-foot wingspan. We headed, we headed back, knowing this was Harpy Eagle territory, and Chris, our senior guide, had several nest sites on his GPS. We stayed overnight in his home up a channel off Akawini Creek. His family studied the photos on my laptop and leafed through my birding Bible, The Birds of Northern South America, as we exchanged formal book uh, book names with local names for the species that we were seeing. The wattle chicana in the book was known as spur wing because of the barbs on its wings. The next day, we said goodbye to the family and motored back to Adele's. There I studied the handcrafts on display. Now it was also to do asset mapping, to determine what skills could be shared and expanded to enrich the ecotourism experience for visitors. I met with food producers of cassava bread, coconut oil, baked cakes, buns, and cookies. I hiked trails that led me to furniture makers and dugout canoe builders. I continued seeking and identifying birds, made it up to about 160 of the 900, and spied this three-toed sloth high in a tree across the creek from Adele's. And it really does have that baby face, and it moves ever so slowly. On occasion, I spent time peeling cassava root and talking with the women in the family in Wakapo where I hung my hammock. Here we would be grinding the cassava to make bread and then straining and, and boiling the juices to make pepper pot soup. A villager pulled the cassava story from her handcraft bag. The uprooting and all the other things I can't quite read, but a good seven steps. There's scraping and grating and twisting of it in a um, palm woven sleeve to get the juices out, sifting and baking. I'd seen an embroidered tapestry of village life when in the Rupununi. A person at one of my uh, birding presentations in BC, they were in Princeton, they weren't in Penticton. Oh, that must be machine embroidery. I replied, they have no sewing machines or electricity in the hinterlands. This is hand embroidery. I was teaching embroidery and beading as a mode of communication with women and young people, along with the asset mapping. This was all part of my mandate, the CUSO mandate of uh, gender equality and social inclusion. 
and it was just fun. The power of the uh, Western development dream, a fossil fuel powered automobile vehicle in a place that had no roads. I arrived with binoculars from the South Okanagan Naturalist Club back home, and I passed them to members of the Akawini Wildlife Group, not a club, but a group. One wise member, Tabita, had said, let's not say club, group is more welcoming. In a coffee shop, while on one of my visits to Georgetown for a CUSO meeting, I arranged to connect with a birding expert in Guyana who looked at my eagle expedition photos and said, I've seen lots of harpy eagles. You photographed a bird that I've never seen. It's a crested eagle and it's an adolescent. That meant at least one mating pair was in Waikanipa, in the Waikanipa area of the Akawini territory. Region two had fresh ecotourism potential with indigenous people keen in both territories to continue. Building on the interest a two-day CUSO initiated Guyanese uh, Environmental Protection Agency training was conducted in Akawini with trainers that I escorted from Georgetown. They'd never been to this part of their own country. The following week, I collected the four young people selected from Akawini for a flight from Georgetown to the North Rupununi for three days of exposure training in ecotourism. Here we are in Sarama, the first indigenous operated ecotourism facility in the country. The young people heard about how to shape a community-based facility and showcase aspects of their indigenous way of life. We also visited the Bina Hill Institute for vocational training for youth to learn more about its tourism program. An interview <clears throat> at the local radio station based at the Institute gave the youth confidence in voicing responses to the experience. Here's Tabita in a birding vest I'd made and passed on to her. She reveled as she revealed a key point in her family history. What? exclaimed the announcer. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm nearly falling out of my chair in surprise. Listeners, this young woman's great-grandfather is our legendary fighter for indigenous territorial rights. Stephen Campbell was our first indigenous, indigenous member of parliament in 1957. We departed with young people clutching application forms for the Bina Hill Institute. Not only foreigners would be interested in the country's natural wonders, but also the urban Guyanese and members of the diaspora. All would be eager to experience more of the biodiversity, beauty, and bounty of the country and would appreciate Guyana's development of its tourist offerings. We were building bridges between worlds and ways of being, thinking, and doing. As I sat on my balcony on my final evening in Georgetown, sipping a taunt of rum, I stared into the pale blue sky and puffy white clouds drifting past and awaited the flock, the flight of a flock of the scarlet ibis from the riparian vegetation on the banks of the Demerara River. They fly diagonally across uh, Georgetown from the southwest to the northeast mudflats to feed on the Atlantic pebble beach 
as its coffee with cream waves receded. A bit of t-shirt philosophy. What we see changes who we are. I'd spent 20 years in education at all levels in various cultures. For another 30 years, I'd been engrossed in energy use in the built environment in the US and India. Cousin Otto in Yukon has dubbed me Mahatma Merle. <laughs> Guyana hadn't changed radically over the two years I'd been there, except for the discovery of offshore oil, but there was no pumping yet. However, my perceptions had shifted. I experienced the power and resilience of people still reeling from the effects of colonial rule. Back in BC, here in Penticton, I returned to cycling in my vintage manufactured home. In 2019, six months back from Guyana, I started reviewing my journals and wrote straight through COVID with publication of my book, Gripped by Guyana, a memoir of purpose and adventure last April. CUSO ended its 58-year involvement in Guyana in June of 2019. I guess the expected income from petroleum production was judged as sufficient to carry the country forward. Perhaps. I've just learned that the Global Carbon Credit Fund has awarded Guyana 457 million US dollars for preservation of 80% of its rainforest as a carbon sink. 15% of the money will be given directly to the nine indigenous tribes to do with as they see fit. I've heard that hospitals and schools are being reconditioned and expanded and that the current government is less grabacious, as Jamaicans would say. Mm -hmm. Real change is underway. I'm planning a return this winter to see for myself if this is true, do more bird watching, and share my book with those in Guyana. With Guyana's abundance of natural resources and unusually small population, this unique country in South America could become a model for attainable, sustainable, development of its natural, cultural, and human resources, along with the wise use of appropriate 21st century technology. I felt safe and calm in Guyana despite its reputation. I loved my time with colleagues, Guyanese friends and neighbors, the taxi drivers, and people in the markets and shops. I found them vibrant and able to laugh despite the considerable struggles they were experiencing in all aspects of their lives, from changes in climate conditions to not enough work to maintain a strong economy. The best comment that demonstrated my value in coming to Guyana came from a dark corner of a home in Wakapo when I was on my laptop with people crowding around to see pictures from the Eagle Quest. Someone said, we didn't know anybody cared. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you.